Hi, my name is Greg. I'm one of the research directors at The Block, and this is the State of Institutional Custody. We're joined by Calvin Shen, who's a managing director at HexTrust, and Elizabeth Matthew, who's the global head of BD and partnerships at MetaMask Institutional. I'll let them give a short introduction about themselves, and then we'll jump in. Ladies first, per usual. Thanks, Calvin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Liz Matthew. I run business development and partnerships for MetaMask Institutional, uh, one of the newer products uh, within the consensus um, um, family. Great to meet you all. Great. And hello, everyone, and thanks for certainly for your time tonight, uh, from, from down from Singapore, that is. Um, my name is Calvin Shen. I'm managing director overseeing global clients business uh, over at Hex Trust. Um, so my role is to make sure that talking to partners, clients globally, uh, to make sure they have a seamless experience uh, working with us. Perfect. So I guess we'll start off with, you know, what does a partnership between MetaMask Institutional and a custodian look like? How does it work operationally, technically? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to share that. So MetaMask Institutional is um, consensus's approach and platform that enables um, the widest access to Web3 for any organization on the planet. And we do that in a multi-custodial uh, custody agnostic approach. Um, Hextrust is one of our esteemed partners on the platform. And so we really separate out um, the, the, the function of being able to initiate a transaction um, across everything that you can do from a regular MetaMask wallet, but adding to that some of the uh, multi-user permissioning governance policies and workflows that an organization might require. And so we, um, we take a pretty agnostic approach um, because we firmly believe that um, no two organizations are alike. Um, and in fact, within an organization, they may need different kinds of custody technology to support their use case. And so we have a, a variety of um, custodial integrations, be it um, HSM uh, providers by regulated entities like Hextrust, as well as MPC networks and multi-sig um, uh, contract wallet technology. Uh, um, and, and our partners are also geographically distributed. And so um, we, we want to be able to provide um, the widest coverage in terms of stack as well as regulatory coverage. Um, and we do that by partnering with, um, uh, with entities like Hextrust. Yeah, from, from um, Hextrust perspective, we're actually very, very excited about this particular partnership. Um, as Liz has mentioned, you know, obviously, I think just about everyone in, in this space knows MetaMask, right, from a user and UI perspective. And really, really, you know, want to retain that because that's kind of what the clients are used to, that familiarity, the ease of use, and really, ultimately, the accessibility to this Web3 um, DeFi space that's so exciting for everyone involved. And we combine this partnership with kind of what Hextrust has been doing since 2018, which is providing institu institutional grade custodial services, providing the best in class safety and safekeeping of digital assets with a licensed framework that offers, you know, a licensed, uh, you know, licensed uh, regulatory framework across the globe, uh, compliant and operational uh, efficiencies, combined safekeeping with the accessibility of, of MetaMask Institutional. This really is a kind of one of the key, um, you know, partnership that forms our thesis on custody, what we deem as custody 3.0, which we can, I think we can talk about a little bit separately. Perfect. So I guess a follow-up to that would be, you know, how do we make DeFi ready for financial institutions? Yeah, I, I could take that. So sort of the um, genesis of MetaMask Institutional was when, um, you know, post DeFi summer, we had institutions that came to us saying that the retail wallet um, was just not fit for purpose for enterprise use. Um, there were, you know, um, compliance considerations to keep in mind. How do you evaluate counterparty risk and, and ensure AML screening um, as an organization when you're about to interact with the DeFi pool? And, and secondly, how do I ensure that I manage to 
provide adequate permissions and define roles and responsibilities for individuals in my organization so I don't have a situation where I'm relying on an individual holding the keys um, to, to an institutional portfolio. And so, um, and, and thirdly, I'd say um, Web3 is fragmented. The data is not straightforward to, um, to track and monitor. And so we set up to basically solve for these three things um, and launched last October, and we've onboarded you know, over 250 organizations since then, solving for these fundamental use cases. Going forward, we are going to continue to iterate to make Web3 more accessible to institutions. And, and I will say, again, no institution is the same. Um, we are seeing a variety of use cases and requirements. And so we're going to continue with additional partners um, globally to provide the kind of governance policies um, and, and sort of security measures that may be specific to an organization that might not be as um, um, aware of the security um, uh, risks in Web3. Yeah, absolutely. And to certainly echo on top of that, you know, we're referring to on the technology and operation, obviously the security side of things. And I think what would be also be a great tailwind to the institutionalization or maturation of uh, DeFi is certainly on the regulatory compliance front, right? So, you know, for example, uh, we know that, you know, kind of the, the past events of, of May and June, there's certainly kind of caught the attention of regulators for good or bad reasons. Um, and I do believe that in the future of the space, there will be some regulations. And I think regulation is overall positive, right? To really add in the kind of um, the um, kind of the value proposition and certainly the validity of this space at, um, in general. And so what we're seeing is a few type of, you know, DeFi focused um, you know, protocols such as Aave Arc, right? It's a permission based uh, DeFi um, uh, uh, you know, protocol. And then Rob, who will be joining us shortly with respect to Clearpool, um, I think they were one of the very first to actually KYC uh, the borrower's pool, right? To actually making sure that you know who you're dealing with, even though this is indeed a DeFi lending protocol. Awesome. As, as a quick follow-up, I'd ask, you know, what are the main concerns and, and touch points that both of you get when you're looking at a less, let's call it crypto native, uh, institution, whether that's you know, a straight legacy TradFi firm or something along those lines. I'm happy Sorry, to I, 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 <laughs> I, I, can go, I can go. I'm. I mean, I'm. I do the. I, Greg, I do think the question that you're asking is actually somewhat narrow in itself, because when you talk about customers that have existing. Um, sort of allocations to other asset classes or things of value. Um, we are really um, just at the beginning. So we certainly have seen the earliest adopters that were nimble crypto native um, funds that wanted to have allocations and um, regular touch points with Web3. Now, if you go sort of further up the curve of mainstream adoption, we're seeing all kinds of entities um, show up and want to be able to participate in Web3. Um, you know, investing in the asset class is one thing, but then the, the multifaceted aspect of this technology means that you um, can essentially think about all kinds of use cases. And we're seeing that, you know, especially with NFTs becoming more mature, we are seeing um, brand names that want to be able to engage with their audiences but with NFTs for community engagement and also um, as, as um, uh, you know, uh, high value assets that, um, that hold value in a fundamentally different way to, to anything we've seen in the traditional uh, markets. Um, we are seeing um, all kinds of service providers, fintechs, VC funds that find themselves with tokens uh, related to Web3, be fungible or non-fungible. And if you wanted to actually put them to work or interact with the Web3 in any way, um, besides just a buy and hold or sell, 
um, you have to think about connectivity to Web3. And that's really where MetaMask Institutional comes in with uh, providing the widest uh, connectivity. Um, so we, we're you know, on MetaMask Institutional today, 60% of organizations are indeed funds that are actively managing portfolios, but you certainly have the other 40% that have don't want to do anything with yield farming, but instead just need to be able to have the workflows and the, um, the permissioning to be able to manage tokens, be, be fungible or not. Right. Yeah, and I think it's also just uh, also, you know, in addition to that, right, from a hex trust perspective, you know, back in 2018, our platform was really purpose built for cryptocurrency, right? So think Bitcoin, right, as a kind of a poster child example. Now, fast forward, obviously, four and a half years later, um, our platform supports exactly as Liz mentioned, fungible, non-fungible, right? Maybe even thinking about security tokens. CBDC is also kind of on the agenda as well. So from our audience perspective, it's not just about digital natives, though we certainly get a lot of inquiries from them that want to access DeFi, generate yield on their holdings, access the different changes for liquidity purposes from a pure you know, uh, monetization perspective. But also what we're seeing on, on recently, and um, you know, it's places um, or brands that you may not even think about. For example, um, luxury brands like Gucci, which is public announced, they're into NFTs. Um, so obviously with NFTs, um, and also because it's built on a different blockchain, they, they had to figure out kind of what this gas fee is. And if gas fee means they need to buy some ETH, so that's how they kind of indirectly get into cryptocurrency without even knowing. Um, another example would be kind of like, um, 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 DBS, for example, right? Also public announced getting into um, Sandbox with virtual land, right? That's another example of NFT and also the metaverse and building this virtual reality world um, that can, you know, be lent out, that could be built upon, that can be built for engagements and all these other different purposes. So the idea here is that, you know, we went starting from cryptocurrency focus to now this new Web3 and honestly, who, who knows what's going to come next, right? Which is, makes it very, very exciting. That's awesome. And I think what you just brought up where you know, in crypto, everything is moving so quickly. And earlier you brought up uh, Custody 3.0. And you know, what is Hextrust doing to achieve its vision of Custody 3.0? Um, you know, offering universal connectivity to the rest of the ecosystem. What does that look like? And how do you define it? Sure. Yeah, so for us, we're currently in the stage of this custom 3.0 era, right? But before we talk a little bit about, about that, what is 1.0? What is 2.0? So 1.0 to us is really kind of the early days, right? Maybe the crypto OG can, can kind of remember and attest to that, which is having a C phrase as a private key printed out on a piece of paper, right? And maybe without sharding, it's really ripping the paper apart. One goes to this day, the other goes to that day. Um, so that's kind of what we talk about as custody 1.0. Again, I'm keeping it very, very high level. Now, moving to 2.0 uh, is what we deem as institutional grade custody. And that's really kind of, you know, obviously when um, Bitcoin first hit 20,000, we're close to it back in 2017, right before the, the real crypto winter. Um, you know, that's really kind of a new wave of institutional grade custody, including Hex Trust, which was founded in fact, uh, back in 2018. And the whole idea of the thesis at the time was that in order for institutional uh, investors to come in this place, there needs to be a regulated licensed infrastructure solution starting with custody, right? That's really how Hectros was founded in the first place. And at the time, the focus is purely thinking cold storage, okay? Cold storage of Bitcoin, and it's really meant to be a buy and hold product, right? So Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies come into case uh, Safe storage, leave it there, don't touch it. And then if you want to withdraw it, you know, maybe cold storage might take a day or two, depending on what type of technology and operations. So, th and, and that's it, right? So that's really kind of what we consider as the 2.0 era, which really started about 2018 when, you know, right before, um, you know, the crypto winter really hit. And we continue to build towards that now to what we deem to be the 3.0 era. And the main difference here is, building on top of 2.0, still having the safe, you know, safety of uh, digital asset uh, uh, custody. Now, years later, we're now licensed, right? And also because the regulatory framework is much more established now, 
um, Head Trust, we have license in, in Hong Kong, Singapore, most recently Dubai, and we will continue to, to grow our footprint. So we can make sure that whatever we're doing is related, you know, is, you know, licensed and regulated, that, you know, there is a, a regulatory body that is overwatching it. And as part of that, it's going to um, get sought to reporting uh, from reputable um, professional service provider, penetration testing, um, fin audited financial statement to make sure that everything we're doing is by the book, right? That the, regula the regulators are watching over us, we're doing the right thing in a compliant manner. And in addition to just having pure safetyness, right? This is kind of really when our um, universal connectivity comes into place, right? Because at this point, investors in digital assets, they don't no longer just want to buy and hold, right? I would consider that to be a very minority. They want to really participate in what this Web3 is all about. So that's why we goes back to why we've deemed this partnership with uh, MetaMask Institution was so important because this provides a universal connectivity. So then if you want to do this NFT thing, right, connect it to, you know, uh, a marketplace and, you know, maybe buy some NFT, right? And then make sure you save that, keep that in safe storage. If you're interested in yield farming, cool, that's cool too. But so what we're theming to be is that we're able to offer on-chain financial services, be it staking, be it governance, be it delegation, be it wrapping, be it NFT, metaverse, game five, et cetera, et cetera. All from the safetyness of a regulated custodial platform. Perfect, perfect. And you know, what are some common misconceptions around custody? How do we truly define custody and digital assets, you know, both from a legal and tech perspective? Uh, I'll take that uh, first. Um, so I, I think it's just obviously it's, it's you know, it may be known to, to many of the audience, but, you know, I think it's just very important to highlight again that custody in its own right, especially, you know, for us where we um, operate under our trust license in Hong Kong, there is a custodian agreement from a legality perspective that we enter into uh, with our clients. And the, actually the name account, the account owner for a custody account belongs to the client itself, it actually does not belong to head trust. So if a custody client um, opens account with us, you know, let's assume, you know, John Smith opens account, for example, the digital asset is recorded under John Smith's name, which is important because that means that John Smith's assets is not part of head trust balance sheet. It's completely segregated, both on an on-chain perspective, because we offer individual segregated wallets on chain, but also from a legality perspective. And, and this is very important, especially as kind of the recent market condition and kind of some of the, you know, the press that, you know, we hear in the press is it means that, you know, God forbid, head trust gets in tr legal trouble, liquidity crunch, uh, as a, obviously a hypothetical example, John's, our custody asset, uh, custody client's assets are completely bankruptcy remote because it's under their name and not part of our um, balance sheet. So that part, I think it's very important why that you know you should consider a custodial account now what how it's a little bit different and, and kind of things that you should consider is that there's a lot of yield enhancing product that we've seen right in, in the market and that's great right because you know like what's wrong with earnings and some passive rewards for for some of the assets that you're looking to deploy and and there's nothing wrong with that because again this is part of the reason why we're in web3 um I think it's important to know and to kind of do your own research on your counterparty risk, which I'm sure Liz will talk about, um, is do your own research, kind of know who your counterparty is. What's this term of service condition that, that you're kind of signing and click I approve, right? Or I agree. Because when sometimes when you're lending your assets, therefore your counterparty gives you yield for that, that movement of asset actually means you're not using a custody account. It becomes, uh, whether it's a lending account, maybe it's a DeFi or et cetera, right? But again, it, it could be various things. Just the point here is do your own research to make sure that, you know, your assets not being rehypothecated. You're actually not using the custody account, for example. Liz, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, I mean, I could talk all day about misconceptions in the industry. There's so many. Um, I think one common misconception is that MetaMask Institutional is a custodian, uh, custodial permissioned version of MetaMask, the retail offering. Um, that's not true at all. 
we are an aggregator platform that connects you to custodial services like, like Hextrust or others that are sort of more um, um, sort of you could really describe them as custody stacks. You, I wouldn't call them as, you know, third party custodian. Um, I do think that there is a place and a use case that lend themselves to the self custodial model. Um, and there are certainly use cases that require a third party fiduciary agent um, um, sort of signing on your behalf. And, and we want to be able to encourage all use cases because we are thinking about this from a long-term perspective of saying as the world adopts blockchain technology in general more things of value are going to be secured on a cryptographically secure ledger which means that organizations um, globally will find themselves holding tokens and will need to have the right um, user permissioning like i already mentioned and connectivity but more importantly um, the ability to be able to track, monitor, and report ownership of these assets in the standardized way. I, you know, this asset class is not impervious to the constraints that other asset classes have. Um, you're going to have to deal with reporting. You're going to have to deal with external stakeholders. Um, you're going to have to have visibility to your exposure in a timely way. And so... Um, we're building for that long sort of long game of, of being able to enable every organization to have the tools to be able to um, interact with Web3 in, in the way that they are most comfortable interacting with. Gotcha. Thank you both. Um, now moving to what are the key differences between engaging with centralized finance and decentralized finance? This, this actually feeds into a question Ricardo Pierdent yeah. has in the chat. Like, like the, yeah, that's, I think you're spot on in terms of asking what is the difference between a custodial service and an exchange service. Um, two things that I'd like to highlight is um, in a centralized um, approach to Web3, um, you're restricted in terms of buy, hold, sell, and potentially there are some products that provide yield opportunities. Whereas when you switch over to a, um, a sort of a browser extension that gives you widest access to Web3 natively without having to go through an intermediary, you can do anything that the ecosystem has built to do, right? So, so we have half a million developers that use Infura those developers are oh we might have lost her I think we, we, we lost her um, um and so really you know over um the last two years we've seen a proliferation of things that can be done in web3 and this goes beyond buy sell hold it, it lends to lending borrowing uh pool positions um staking hedging um batch transactions, NFTs. There's, there's so many ways of community engagement related to tokens. And you're doing a disservice um, by restricting yourself to trying to adopt um, mediums of distribution that look similar to Web 2.0, uh, but then you're kind of missing the point. And then the second thing is counterparty risk. And, and Calvin mentioned this, but... Um, you know, I think there's this refrain in uh, crypto that institutions are evil and, you know, everything needs to be strictly peer to peer. Well, I mean, a, an, an institution or an organization is a collection of individuals that have come together to coordinate for a common goal. And so the moment you have an organization involved, um, uh, you know, you, you're going to have counterparty risk as you um, sort of. Um, interact with that organization. And then that's when I would say, because of the nascency of this market, um, you really need to be careful about what counterparty risk you choose to take. Um, you know, um, as opposed to other mature markets, I think, you know, there is a level of consumer protection and 
safety rails and you know, established rules around if you are an institution, you have to abide by certain rules. Um, we're not there yet. You know, we're still waiting for regulatory clarity. And so until we get there, you have to be, you have to do your own research of which counterparties you're willing to face. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key here, again, is on the counterparty versus side, which, again, is being highlighted with the recent market events. Um, so I, I think the, the key here is certainly do your own research per, you know, the, the guidance that we've been kind of given. Um, and the kind of the main difference between C5 centralized, obviously, this that counterparty risk, do your own research uh, on, you know, whether certain, you know, a counterparty has, you know, maybe that's providing financial audit, financial statements or providing, you know, over collateralization, right? Some of, sometimes, you know, I think some of the things we heard over the past, you know, from a lending perspective is that some of the counterparties were lending unsecured for a variety of reasons, which turned out to be not the best of ideas, right? DeFi, on the other hand, yes, understood in theory, there, you know, there's still somebody on the other side. So yes, absolutely, there's still count counterparty risk in addition to protocol risk. Um, so I think that's kind of the reason if we want DeFi to really become institutionalized, right? That, you know, we to get the uh, regular spy in and also to get, you know, large institutional investors coming in this space. I mean, there are different approaches. Now, not to say one is better than the other, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, Arve Arc, for example, their, their method is to be permission. So everyone goes into this DeFi circle, has to be KYC, AML, whitelisted, and so forth. Okay, maybe that, that's one way, right, to kind of have a close ecosystem. The other way is, for example, is kind of what Clearpool is doing, which is offering un under collateralized lending, uh, which really um, puts out single borrower pools. So if you go on, you know, their website, you can see that, you know, very reputable market makers, they're actually the borrower, they open their own pool um, under their name. So you know that your counterparty risk is this, you know, market maker. And they obviously certain, carry certain reputation in, in the space, but again, do your own research. But the idea here is that you have the opportunity to actually lend to a counterparty that you believe is worth lending to. And certainly that you know, consideration, that risk level that you deem to be, obviously will be uh, differ based on the various interest rate that you will get back, right? So then ultimately it becomes a market equilibrium, which essentially becomes a credit default swap in the traditional world, right? So that's another way to kind of do, do this type of, um, you know, halfway permission DeFi. And I'm sure there's other methods as, as, as well, but the idea is that, you know, having some type of clarity, uh, whether it's from a regulatory perspective, you know, whether it's from KYC, um, I think from a long-term perspective, it's positive for, for this space. Perfect. And what type of digital asset companies need enterprise custody solutions? Well, I, I, I'm going to be very, you know, biased opinion here, but I mean, I think every single company, digital asset company, really do need enterprise customer solution. Now, again, I totally understand, and, and Liz, Liz kind of mentioned this earlier, this is not to say you need a third party custodian and this is kind of end all be all, right? There are sometimes, you know, you know, in my opinion, self custody or, you know, from a retail investor perspective, you know, I, I have a I have a ledger myself and I, I, I help run Hex Trust, but that's totally fine, right? Because at the end of the day, just making sure your asset is safe is ultimately and protect your own investment is the most important thing. And there are many ways to do it. So from a company perspective, right? Even, you know, I think about liability. I think about downside risk. I think about, oops, if my treasury assets were to be stolen or compromised, I might be out of business. I might have to lay people off, right? So there's really bad things that can happen from a company's perspective. So if I were the company owner, then I would be thinking about third-party custodian because then the liability of losing digital asset effectively becomes um, that of the custodian. Now, this goes back to counterparty risk again because not every you know, custody provider or enterprise custody solution is created equal, right? As I mentioned earlier, there's different licenses. Are you, or actually some are still unlicensed, unregulated. Some are licensed, some are licensed in jurisdictions, some are, you know, various jurisdictions. Some might have, you know, SOC 2 reporting, SOC 1 reporting, some might not, some might be in progress. 
And also kind of the technology is also a little bit different, right? Be it HSN, be it multi-sig, be it NPC, be a combination of all the above, mm -hmm. right? So there are multiple ways to make sure that it fits your business. Um, there are many ways. So it goes back to, to kind of do your own research. But I mean, I'll, uh, the short, uh, the long answer, when it answer to my kind of response is that a third party custodian really captures downsides uh, for you to run your business. So then the idea is that I want the business owners to be able to sleep at night, sleep at night, knowing that their digital asset is safe. That's ultimately what I want the business owners to, 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 to feel. I'm going to go even more maximalist and say every organization on the planet. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I came across a quote. I'm going to read this. I know it's cliche to say a quote, but um, Stephen King said that as a species, we are fundamentally insane. Put more than two of us in a room and we pick sides and start dreaming up reasons to kill one another. Why do, we, <laughs> why do you think we invented politics and religion? So to the extent that you have more than one individual that needs to be in control of this asset and the, and the private keys, um, you're going to want to define governance policies that ensure um, sort of the workflows that you, you want um, to be followed within your organization. And so if you are a non-individual that holds tokens, um, you really don't want to have to have that single point of failure with one individual that has to hold seed phrases and may lose it or might leave the company. Um, and so that, that, you know, anyone that is a non-individual, I think needs to have um, MetaMask institutional and, and one of the custodians on the platform. So, so overall it's like, should organizations hold tokens? I think so. There are definitely organizations that do. Um, some of our earliest adopters were absolutely thriving in the last six months, like um, less than half a percent of organizations on MMI had to liquidate in the last sort of price action. Um, they were actively hiring. They, they're in a good spot. And we think that it's because they've been thinking about um, the, the, the monitoring and tracking of their Web3 portfolio um, using best-in-class infrastructure. And, and, and we want to be able to do that for any organization that decides to interact with Web3. Perfect. And, you know, if all institutions need custody, how, how do their needs differ when you look at different types of organizations? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the use case, right? You you could have a high high frequency trader that needs programmatic access to Web three. You could have a VC fund that um, you know collects tokens on the back of investing in these projects, but really just don't you know don't want to put the assets to work. You could have a Web two well known brand name that wants to be able to interact with their community in a in a way that matches the workflows they require internally so it really spans the gamut of um, of different use cases and then there are certainly different asset classes that traditional capital markets have not served well um you know this uh, what we would call real fi um so esg or microfinance there's certainly um areas where capital has not freely flowed between um, supply and demand. And so we talk to many organizations. Clearpool is a great example of one where they are operating at the institutional level, but are ultimately matching credit supply and demand. So I, I remain really excited about, you know, that that segment of use case um, developing further. Yeah, it, it, it really depends on the organization, which I know it's very broad. Right, so we deal with kind of the largest one, for example, banks, right, as, as an example. Obviously, multinational banks, you have to even think, I mean, what always, because they're talking to us as a custodian, obviously they care about custody, security, right? That's, that's a given. Um, I will say I, we actually spend more time talking about compliance these days, which, you know, it's, you know, be it travel rules, be it KYC, you know, KYC AML. So that's, you know, another type of, integration that we have to offer in addition to our custodial solution, right? 
Um, and then, you know, if it's, you know, again, this is a complicated example, but think about data sovereignty issue for these large, you know, multinational banks, right? If your home office is in, you know, in, in Europe, there's also GDPR, the privacy rules. So you kind of have to kind of take that into consideration. Uh, but because they have satellite office in Singapore, okay, well, how, what does that mean from a cloud perspective? Um, and then think about data centers, think about the physicality of the HSM. So I, I think it, it, it just gets complicated real fast, right? So, you know, from our perspective, you know, because we, you know, also develop the technology ourselves, our custodial uh, technology, we also able to offer on-premises or, you know, what we call a custody as a service solution to some of these very large players. And it honestly, every, you know, financial institution is very different. So very complicated. Really, we, we do, um, we have to really just kind of do what, whatever it is that they, they need. To kind of the more digital native side of things, right? This also, again, depending on type of, of um, um, the client. So if you're a fund, crypto funds, then to them is about accessibility to different liquidity providers, right? Maybe it's for arbitrage reasons, maybe it's for liquidity, debts, and, and so forth. In which case, then from a custodial perspective, then they probably would require a hot wallet. Um, so speed is of the utmost importance. And if we can offer accessibility to say things like staking, which then be enable passive uh, you know, reward generation, then that's what they care about. Or you can give you another, just kind of a, a more hybrid example, just to wrap it up, is that you can think about kind of a, a blockchain foundation, right? So, so, you know, layer one foundations, right? That obviously, you know, issues, you know, uh, governance tokens. And some of that, those tokens could be very, very valuable from a treasury perspective, but also from a governance perspective, from a community, grants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden this becomes a, you know, a full-fledged, um, you know, nonprofit foundation that obviously requires custody, right? Because these assets, you know, the, the, the tokens could be vested or locked up for a, a finite period of time, but they might need a trade execution because they might need to convert that to fiat to fund operating expenses, perhaps. Um, they might need to, you know, distribute that to their ecosystem partners from a grant perspective, um, and maybe kind of run validators, you know, to kind of providing rewards and so forth, right? So then they will also need a custodial solution so in, in the middle. So ultimately, you know, it's, it really depends on the, um, the, the client themselves. Gotcha. And, you know, with all the new use cases coming out, what's the importance of having an airtight custody strategy and what are the best practices? Um, you know, do you have any commentary surrounding any recent hacks, uh, improper seed phrase storage? Would love to hear from both of you. Sure. Um, so air, air, air tight, I mean, uh, or I, I kind of took it also as kind of air gap, right? So in cold storage, which is kind of the standard, um, kind of the, the gold standard, so to speak, these days, right? And having an air gap environment basically means, you know, there's no internet connectivity, there's no Wi-Fi signal and so forth. So it kind of at least take away one attack vector, which is from outside threats. Now, the, the issue with that is, yes, it's important, but it's only one of the many attack vectors. So Liz mentioned this many times again, it's about this segregation of duty, right? Having multiple people in the organization, each user role may, you know, each person with the department may have a different user role. So the whole idea is that, you know, we don't want, you know, maybe the owner to be to have a super admin, right? So basically the, you know, the, the founder CEO can just kind of do the thing and, and, you know, withdraw assets unilaterally, right? We kind of, you know, discourage that um, from, from happening. Now, any major kind of organization, right, that it might be, they can kind of loop in their compliance department that works in conjunction with the operations department that works in conjunction with the trade execution department, so forth, so forth. And they can, you know, use, you know, a multi-state process perhaps, right, that requires two or three, three or five or whatever bespoke kind of um, core and base authentication scheme. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have multiple type of wallets. So yes, we do have a cold wallet, which we, we still do. And, you know, it's a standard, uh, but also we work with MMI, right? The idea is that again, to have this, you know, user experience that our clients are used to, but the idea is that there is, you know, some core and base authentication scheme in, a, you know, in advance so that, you know, our clients can use uh, um, some of the customized workflow that we've already built into our platform. And then ultimately, 
have the right core and base authentication scheme and use MMI as, you know, a very flexible signing, um, uh, you know, UX in order to, to reach to, you know, the Web3 world, right? So just, again, various uh, customization. And I think what we really can offer from um, our solution perspective is the flexibility. Because again, every organization has their unique um, needs and differences. So we want to offer that flexibility. Liz, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, no I, you know, we, um, I think as the industry is maturing uh, from sort of earliest adopters to more um, um, sort of mainstream adoption, you know, we, we're actually separating out the trade life cycle in Web3 into initiating of a transaction with any of the 17,000 dApps that you can interact with through MMI. Um, and then the signing, submitting, and broadcasting. So what, what we would consider in traditional finance a settlement finality. And we're really separating these two stages of the trade lifecycle out or with MMI, and we look to our custodial partners to manage the settlement finality aspect of the trade lifecycle. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and so we actually have a question from Scott in the chat, which is, how does custody 3.0 change the SLAs for an institutional custody provider? Yeah, actually, the, sh the short answer is actually not much. So the, as it stands right now, the SLA for, for our custodial solution, right, again, it, it all starts with custody. Um, even for our cold wallet perspective, I mean, I think we, we can actually do a same day transaction for our cold wallet. So, you know, it's not like we're talking about days paper, sign off, or things like that, right? Everything is done via our platform. The authentication scheme can be done via mobile apps. Um, you know, we can even leverage the, the UV keys for, as an example. I mean, there are multiple ways and ultimately cold wallet, we can do a same day. Okay. Now for 3.0, right? This kind of talking about accessibility, right? So this is part of the reason why, you know, MNI again, why I keep highlighting why this is important is that, you know, most of us have probably used Minimask already. So you can see how easy it is. So from our perspective, think about that user experience, right? When you go to a, 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 a you know, a DeFi platform or, or DAP, it says connect wallet on the top right, usually Metamask institutional, click connect, you see your balance, do whatever the, uh, the website offers and the signing process, the key management system takes it back to the uh, Hextrust platform. So all of this has been seamlessly integrated. So actually, you know, there's no kind of increase. I mean, maybe a few buttons, perhaps, than if you were to just, you know, deposit. <laughs> but, you know, this is kind of what I mean by this ultimately, this experience for safety and universal accessibility. Ultimately, this is going to be a, a part of our everyday lives in, in this ecosystem. And there's not going to be a trade off by, you know, you have to do something extra that's so confusing, right? It's going to be a very seamless part of a solution that's end to end, soup to nuts and you will be able to access the best thing that this uh, ecosystem has to offer. I could maybe add to that based on Anu Pandey's question, right? We actually do help um, sort of pre-model the transaction and we do show all the transfers associated with your transaction on a pre-trade basis for you to be able to um, run a check pre-trade if you are about to interact with any um, uh, sanctioned transfer exhibiting uh, address. Um, and, and so we, we have an in-house tool called Codify Compliance, which is natively available on the MetaMask institutional browser extension, as well as the dashboard that enables you to run a report pre-trade in order to screen for um, sort of AML and KYT constraints pre-trade, uh, not only for your own transaction, but also will query all the transfers in and transfers out for every address that has ever interacted with the pool that you're about to interact with. And so we, we certainly do give you um, visibility. This goes into the whole host of solutions that we have built for an organization to be able to comply to some of the requirements that they, they need to from, um, from a regulatory standpoint. 
Awesome. And then I actually have a question. Um, at least at the block, we've, we've been seeing that you know, funding has slowed down a little bit. We're in, you know, kind of a little crypto pullback. And when you look at short and long-term views on custody and institutional offerings, where do the two of you see it going? I think we recently saw Galaxy's acquisition of BitGo fall through. Are we going to see more consolidation? Um, I'd love to hear thoughts. Sure. So from, from, you know, from Hex Trust perspective, right, we absolutely do believe that this custodial space, right, the true kind of custody players, um, there will be a consolidation. And we've already seen that, right, be, be it M&A activities, uh, be it, you know, acquisitions, or, you know, again, you rightfully point out that potential Galaxy and Bigo would have been one example. Um, so there's, there's no question, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day the business model for a custodial is a scale, right? And and you need to have the right scale or, you know, or honestly, it's very hard for you to survive just purely from a custody business. So I, I think an example, a great example of that would just be just look in the traditional world. You have the big four custodial banks, State Street, B1 Mellon, uh, Norton Trust, JP Morgan, right? They're the kind of the concentration for those four is, I, I I don't, I don't know how many, but, you know, super majority of the AUC in TreFi world. It's the same kind of path that I'm, that we're seeing in the digital asset space. Um, and you're already seeing that, right? I mean, I, you know, I read, you know, we're, I'm a big uh, avid reader of the research from the block, right? And you can <laughs> see kind of the kind of um, the founding uh, timeline for a cust custody. And there used to be a lot of different logos. And then these logos are becoming a little bit smaller, right? It's a little bit smaller here and there, but then these individual logo gets bigger. So you can see that the top ones, I mean, I think you can easily see some what would be the top ones. Those would be the ones with, you know, unicorn status, multi hundred dollar, you know, uh, raises, um, and you, you'll know who they are. Um, and, and those, those guys, right. They don't have, you know, they're funded in this eco in this space. They can start picking out and start acquiring smaller, uh, competitors. We've already seen it. We've seen some of that. And I, my opinion is that it will continue uh, this way. Yeah, so short term, I mean, we've not seen, it was barely a blip in May when we saw all that price action um, for customers on the platform. There was sort of a knee jerk uh, withdrawal of assets uh, from pools. There was sort, sort of a flight to quality to move out of um, sort of lesser known protocols into sort of the, the, the bigger blue chip protocols, if you will. Um, but, you know, we've seen that capital get reallocated. We're back to the highs, the all time highs. Um, we continue to onboard new organizations uh, onto the platform. So given how early we are, um, our growth has been quite um, uh, decoupled from everything that's happening in, in crypto overall. And we continue to see that going forward. Um, longer term, I think for um, sort of going beyond um, speculative capital, right? we want to be able to see um, real use cases emerge for a market to develop depth. And so I think there are some things that need to be solved for around a scalable way to establish investor suitability um, at the institutional level, at least. Um, we've, um, you know, we're working with all the major identity providers around how do we solve for this in a scalable way that travels um, uh, not, you know, maybe a handful of protocols, but can travel across the tens of thousands of protocols, giving the widest access to institutions to interact in, in a way that still maintains um, some of the reporting requirements they, they need. So establishing decentralized identity in a scalable way is a key concern for us. Um, and, and establishing some of the tooling required to manage operational risk. Um, you know, I think the governance policies is still quite um, varied across our various um, custodial partners. I do think that there will be a standardization of what is considered a confirmation on a transaction. Um, and, 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 and we hope that our platform continues to standardize that, um, um, you know, the, the sort of the post-trade stuff 
um, after a transaction uh, for the industry. Um, we, we continue to work with best-in-class um, service providers in giving more visibility to an organization on what it is that they are doing in Web3. You know, we have our in, in, in-house tooling that converts what you're about to do into human-readable text for an approver to understand, but then adding on top of that analytics that give you a sense of various um, uh, threats that you are going to be exposed to um, that is unique to Web3. And so we'll, we'll continue to iterate and provide best in class um, uh, analytics to support that. Perfect. And we have a question in the chat from George, which is, how are you thinking about SAB 121? Yeah, I don't know if SAB 121 affects Hex Trust. I mean, it certainly doesn't impact us because we're not a bank, we're not an OCC chartered bank. Um, but in speaking to some of our counterparts that are affected by it, um, I mean, so, so there, there are some nuances in how you think about self-custody versus third-party custody. And Calvin's spoken about the bankruptcy remoteness aspect of, of the vaults that they provide customers. So I don't know if the, the, the SAB 121 argument of having a certain number of um, sort of assets to, to be maintained when you have when you are custodying cryptocurrency on your balance sheet. Um, honestly, I I don't know how much um, traction that would have. I do think that um, th that some of our partners I've spoken to are not that concerned about it, and will continue to work with regulators to establish um, guidelines that sort of are more in line with the nature of this technology. Calvin, do you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, I, I don't. It's, it's an OC, I believe it's it's an OCC. I mean, don't hold me to it. I'm not like a policy sure. expert, but I do think it's an OCC directive that 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 Hex Trust would not be. Subject. Yeah, and we currently don't have any operations in, in the U.S. for the time being. But I think that I think the general rule, um, kind of the general thought is on um, just similar is obviously for from our perspective, as I mentioned in the beginning of the call is. In general, we definitely do welcome regulatory clarity, right? Um, I think that's that's certainly going to be a, a tailwind to this industry. Um, now, yes, there will be sometimes will be you know controversial kind of regulations and so forth. I think that's inevitable, right? I mean, we can't just all have we, what we all wanted to be business friendly and so forth, right? So, some, something's going to come and, and get. But generally speaking, at a very high level. Right. I mean, for us, we go through the, the process of getting licenses and, you know, in locations where we operate. Part of that is to educate the regulators and kind of what we're seeing in the market, engaging the ecosystem, provide best practice. So a lot of this is a very consultative approach to my clients, but also to regulators as well. So, you know, maybe, you know, generally speaking, again, is long term positive, right, for this ecosystem. Perfect. Um... All of our uh, participants, if you have any questions, I would drop them in the chat. Um, but we're coming to a close here. I'd say, you know, we've been talking a lot about regulation and, you know, the whole argument behind CBDCs and, and just continued regulation, whether that's within the US or in Europe or Asia. Um, you know, do you think regulators are warming up to crypto, especially with some of the events earlier this year or outside of, I mean, you just brought up, you know, further education. What's, what's the path forward in the roadmap to further get regulators on board? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the merge um, uh, expected anytime this week is certainly drawing a lot of attention among regulators. I think it's encouraging um, a discussion around a genuine need to understand the technology, the consensus mechanism, blockchain technologies. So I think it's, um, I think it's all extremely positive um, for the Ethereum ecosystem in how we discuss this with policy um, makers and regulators, the ESG story, and sort of the, um, the fact that this is now moving to a more decentralized network are all positive things. I mean, uh, the technology is about being able to provide um, sort of more sort of distribution 
um, socially, um, you know, in terms of ownership rights and, and, and you know, assets. And so, you know, it, it is all extremely, like these are things that regulators should want to know more about. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, we were able to take a chance to be able to highlight this, you know, historically important upgrade on the network just gives us that level of prominence um, uh, among policymakers. So it's all good. I, I think for, from my perspective, it's absolutely education, right? At the end of the day, this is a market that does not sleep, right? So innovation always, it's, you know, always has the curse ahead of regulation, right? So from my perspective, I think, you know, from discussing, you know, talking about this with regulators globally, is that I think at this point, major um, jurisdiction, they are very digital asset friendly. Now I, I use the word digital asset, I didn't use the word cryptocurrency. Right, because, which is a subset of, of digital asset. The idea here is that you know we're educating on this technology that has so much potential to even transform our lives. Right, the social component, the ESG component. One, just one of the many examples of that is think about cross-border payment. Right, I'm in Singapore, Southeast Asia, traditionally been known to be one of the most underserved, unbanked uh, population globally. Right. People don't have equal access to financial services that we kind of, you know, maybe from the states we kind of take for granted at times. So the idea is that this cross border payment, right, by using, you know, maybe blockchain technology, be it whatever blockchain, right, I'm, I'm totally agnostic from that perspective, but you can do it something instantly for a fraction of a cost. And that is literally just from that easy example, provide a cruise value to the end users um, to be able to kind of, you know, kind of retain most of the value that, you know, from their hard work, um, you know, doing whatever it is that, you know, that they're doing, right? So, I mean, the, ex the example can keep going on and on, mm -hmm. right? But generally speaking, again, it's this technology on how, you know, we can move into this Web3 and obviously NFTs, intellectual property, you know, uh, independent artists and all that good stuff, right? Again, this, this can go on and on. Um, but I want to keep a high level that this is the technology that has the, you know, the potential to transform our, you know, the next generation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, I think we're uh, about out of time. Um, I'd like to thank both of our guests and you can find the recording of this video and webinar on both the Block Research's website as well as on YouTube. Uh, but hope everyone has a, a good day or good evening in Calvin's case. And uh, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Take care.